What is the message to be sent out there to folks when these hospitals are seeing similar numbers and similar occupancy rates that we saw this same time last year? I mean, the message has been out there. Unfortunately, because of fake news and misinformation, it's being um, combated by that. But the message is clear, and that is to get the vaccine. Get the damn shot. It, we have been in this predicament for almost two years now, and we have been waiting for a vaccine for months. We finally have it, and now all of a sudden people don't want to take it because of misinformation. And to me, it feels like that uh, that anecdote about how the man is drowning and he's praying to God for you know somebody to save him, and all of these resources just drift on by. He, there's a a boat that passes him by, there's a lot of wood that passes him by, but he just is adamant that God is going to take care of him absent the resources that God gave him. And I'm not trying to make this a, a religious sentiment, but it, it feels like people are waiting for something else to happen right. in order for them to get the vaccine when all of those things have already happened. We have been approaching you with uh, resources on how to get vaccinated. We have been approaching you with ways to get to uh, a vaccination site safely. We have been coming to you with methods just in case you can't get the vaccine, what to do um, in the event that you can't, such as masking up, social distancing, all of these things. And it's like cog the strongest cognitive dissonance ever for people yeah. to just not associate doctors orders with what actually needs to happen get the damn shot that is the message that's the message i, I want to also uh, open it up to michael hawktep if you wouldn't mind just ask dr gaffney um a question that is related to this topic here with the covid 19 in the delta variant and, and what we're saying who was that question for Oh, okay. All right. All right. Uh, Dr. Alexa uh, Gaffney, thanks for coming on today. Question for you. Can you talk about how the uh, mRNA technology is not new, the technology that the uh, Moderna vaccine is based upon um, and the, um, the other vaccine? Can you talk about how that's not new technology? One of the apprehensions that people have is they say that uh, the vaccine was rushed. Now, I think uh, Trump naming it uh, warped speed the whole project warp speed. I don't think that helped anything. But, yeah. Uh, can, can, can you talk about that? And also with the Delta vi uh, variant, um, why is the why is the transmissibility so much more higher than with the um, coronavirus strains we were dealing with in 2020? Sure. So as far as the production of these vaccines, um, remember. COVID-19 is SARS-2 coronavirus, and there was right. SARS-1 um, that happened well over a decade ago. And SARS-1 was not as transmissible, but much more deadly than COVID-19 even. And so they have been working on vaccines back then. So that that didn't become a pandemic, but that epidemic sort of petered out over time. And so that was kind of shell technology that they pulled back out because they recognized that, listen, we have these mRNA vaccines or we have this mRNA technology that we can utilize. And all we have to do is get the genetic code for um, the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-CoV-2, and apply right. that genetic code to this mRNA based technology that we've had in the works for decades, and we can utilize that to make vaccines that would be effective to fighting the virus that causes COVID-19, sars coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. So uh, this is not new technology. This is technology that has been in place and has been used for other modalities as well, like cancer treatments and therapeutics. So we are just using old technology, or, or we basically have just taught an old dog new tricks in terms of application of this type of research and this type of vaccine technology to a new virus and a new infection. And the beautiful thing about mRNA vaccines is that you can produce them very quickly. Unlike a flu vaccine, where you're essentially growing a viral culture, um, that can take 
months, almost a year to produce a vaccine. So because the technology allows for quicker production of the vaccine, we're better positioned to potentially end this COVID-19 pandemic because we don't run into issues with, you know, the time we need to produce these vaccines. So it's old technology that has been manipulated for a new current situation. So it's not like COVID came on the scene in China in October of 2019, and now and now all of a sudden the work started. That has, was work technology research that was already being done. And the only reason it was be, it was, we were able to bring the vaccine forth is because the rate at which people were getting infected, right? When you had mm -hmm. millions of people per day getting infected, you can reach your endpoint of your clinical trial very quickly. It's not like if somebody was trying to make a new measles vaccine, let's say, since measles is always part of the vaccine conversation, right? right? We see measles cases so infrequently, it would take you years to figure out if your new measles vaccine was effective because you don't really see cases that often. So you don't reach a clinical endpoint um, as quickly as you do when literally millions of people around the world are being diagnosed with the infection you're trying to prevent with your vaccine. So a lot of healthcare dollars, a lot of federal dollars, a lot of do dollars worldwide were thrown at this research, which funding is oft often an issue. You had multiple parties involved. And people need to remember, like, not every vaccine that was research was brought to market, right? They started with over 150 vaccine candidates. That list dwindled down to 26 or 28. Then we had like a top seven contenders. And here in the United States, we have three of those seven available to us. There are other um, vaccine candidates that are available in other parts of the world that the CDC and the FDA said, you know what, that's not for us. We're going to stick with these three and we'll continue to see how it goes. And to me, that's very promising and very reassuring. So I want people to remember that not every vaccine candidate that um, was researched um, came to human clinical trials. Some of them were weeded out before then. And not every vaccine was determined to be safe and effective for use. So the three that we're using are what was determined to be most suitable for use in American people. And, you know, this is based on old as well as new vaccine research data. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Then, Gaffney, so, I want to bring in Brittany sure. Lee Lewis, uh, our political analyst, uh, to weigh in and ask you a question as well. Brittany. Sure. Uh, doctor, first off, thank you so much for your work during this time. Um, one of the things that I often hear uh, people say is, why do I need to get the vaccine if I can still get COVID? Um, so if you wouldn't mind just quickly talking through maybe herd immunity or why folks should still get the vaccine. Yeah. So, you know, we can put the herd to the side because we're not even close to that because American people just won't cooperate. Um, but the reason you're getting the vaccine is, number one, for you, right? Put your oxygen mask on before you start trying to assist everybody else on the plane or before you start trying to jump in and deal with the herd. So if the, the simplest way to put it is that the vaccine is a vaccine. It's not a dome. It's not a protective bubble. It's not a force field. The vaccine doesn't keep you in the house. The vaccine doesn't make you put your mask on. The vaccine doesn't make you avoid crowds of people. The vaccine doesn't make the people who you are exposed to wear their mask, avoid crowds, and it doesn't keep other people from getting affected, infected, excuse me, nor does it keep other people from transmitting the virus. So the vaccine is so that when you're out in the grocery store or when you're forced to go to work like me, um, let's say, I don't know, maybe my mask is not pressed as tightly against my face, or maybe it's a little damp and I needed to change it five patients ago, and here comes somebody who's not wearing their mask properly, or maybe they're sick and they're coughing, they're sneezing, and they're spewing COVID-19 virus particles all over the place. And the virus lands in my eyes, or I breathe it in, or it's on my counter and I rub it in my eye, whatever the case may be, right? We know it's highly transmissible. So my vaccine protects me if I have a personal failure, I go out, I do the wrong things, or if I have a mass failure, um, even if I breathe in and acquire the virus, I may not get the, the syndrome of COVID-19. I may not have a symptomatic infection. And even if I do, 
I'm still most likely to stay out of the hospital and I'm still more likely not to die of the virus than a vaccine, an unvaccinated person, excuse me. So we get the vaccine so that we don't die. We get the vaccine so we don't land in the hospital. We get the vaccine so we don't end up with long COVID syndrome or um, COVID long haulers disease, which is really debilitating and turning out to be a significant disabling condition that we're still learning about because people are still having evolving symptoms. But we cannot sit here and say or pretend or allow people to believe that because people can breathe in this virus and ultimately test positive for it or get cold-like symptoms or flu-like symptoms, that doesn't make the vaccine a failure. If they didn't go in the hospital and if they didn't die, the vaccine did exactly what it was supposed to do. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaffney. Um, just really quickly, I remember I was seeing something uh, on social and it's really we have to be careful because we have to know where we get our sources from. But I did see a photo. I want to ask you this, Dr. Gaffney, um, of a person who had COVID-19 and they were unvaccinated. Um, they had a, a cloudy chest, a very cloudy chest. And then there was a person who contracted COVID-19 and their chest seemed to be much more clear. Is, is there some uh, some tie into all of this that's showing that you get COVID, but the symptoms are less severe. Yes. So definitely the severity of illness um, overall has been significantly less in vaccinated persons in comparison to unvaccinated persons. The exception to that is in immunocompromised individuals, where if someone was immunocompromised and vaccinated and had a breakthrough infection, they were more likely to be hospitalized in comparison to someone um, who had a normal healthy immune system and was also vaccinated. When you talk about the unvaccinated person versus the vaccinated person, because the severity of the disease is much less in the vaccinated individual, you don't see the pneumonia, you don't see the overwhelming inflammation in the lungs, you don't see the respiratory failure, you don't see um, as significant of a need for oxygen therapy. So someone who's vaccinated may need oxygen via a nasal cannula or the little prongs that go in your nose, but someone who is unvaccinated is more likely to need mechanical ventilation. So like having a, an intubation, having a breathing tube put down or having to be put on um, a BiPAP machine or some other form of mechanical ventilation. Um, so there's huge differences in terms of, you know, all of the outcomes, the blood clots, the strokes, the heart attacks, the abnormal heart rhythms, um, all other organ damage, right? We've seen liver damage, kidney damage and right. failure, heart failure in unvaccinated individuals with COVID-19 infection. And we are less likely to see that in vaccinated individuals. And this surge is a surge of really unvaccinated people. 97 to like 99% of most hospitalized patients right now are unvaccinated. So please don't let these misinformed, you know, disinformation spreading people have you believe that this surge is because of a vaccine failure. It is absolutely not. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Alexia Gaffney. We appreciate you. Hopefully folks heard you uh, and they get it clear. Um, again, this is nothing to play around with. Folks, back to our Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. Uh, Seat.com, we are partnering with them, of course. Uh, we appreciate their support right here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, check out uh, a couple of their uh, products uh, that you can take advantage of. And you're watching us. What's going on in this Quavo Huncho? Right now, you're in the Huncho's world. Please let the music play. Enjoy the uh, Seek.com video by using one of their uh, virtual reality headsets. All you do is just pop your phone right here uh, into the VR headset and enjoy the content. Uh, you can also uh, take advantage of uh, their 360-degree uh, headphones. Uh, these headphones here uh, come in a couple of colors, black and gold, but then also uh, all gold. And so uh, you can uh, check these out if you want to use our promo code uh, to get a discount. Uh, it's RMVIP21, RMVIP21.
Uh, and then, of course, a, a portion of the proceeds comes back to Roland Martin Unfiltered, uh, which allows for us to fund the show. And so uh, this is a black-owned company. We certainly believe uh, in supporting black-owned companies. Uh, Barry Spio is the founder. Uh, and so, again, go to Seek.com and use the promo code RMVIP21.